Welcome everybody to our session on the angels of God. This is being recorded for ChristadelphianVideos.org and my name is Ron Cowie from South Australia. We now come to our third session on the angels of God and we're going to look particularly tonight at the way they represent God on the earth. The reason we come to this subject with some enthusiasm is because it helps resolve one of the greatest dilemmas that you can have if you just read the Bible on the surface. And I have to confess that until I was in my teens, I read the Bible with some consternation because I constantly came across this fact that God seemed to appear to people on the earth, and yet we are told very clearly in the Bible that no man can see God. And so passages like John 1, 18 and the first of John 4, verse, 4, verse 12, make that very clear. No man has seen God at any time. And when they say that, they mean no man has seen God the Father at any time, because we could not behold the majesty of God. We could not stand in his presence in our mortal condition and survive. The light, the power, the spirit which exudes from God is far too much for us to behold. So we find in the first of Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15 to 16 a similar statement. It says, The blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. So every other being that's ever existed and will exist, will derive their immortality from God, who has no beginning and no end. He's the only infinite, uncreated creature that's ever existed. And we, we, we are completely unable to understand the infinity of God. But he dwells in light unapproachable, which no man can approach unto, who no man has seen nor can see. So we're left in no doubt that when it comes to the, to the great God of the universe, the great creator of all things, who dwells in the heavens, that we could never, ever exist in his presence because of our mortality and his greatness of power and light that exudes from him. So it's impossible for men to actually see the Father in heaven, and it's impossible, therefore, for God to come to the earth and, and to confront men face to face. So it helps us then to resolve passages like this one in, in Exodus 33 and verse 11. It says, Yahweh spoke to Moses face to face. That's impossible when you take the statements above to be true. So there has to be an explanation how we can have God speaking to men face to face. And here's how we look at it. We call it the process of representation. Now, if I have a, <clears throat> a burglary in my house and I call the police, I want someone to come to make a report, perhaps hopefully take fingerprints and get uh, tracking down the criminal, uh, whatever the police have to do. I do not need to know the individual policeman's name or his family tree or anything about him in particular. He's there to do a job on behalf of the police force. So his individuality, <coughs> excuse me, his individuality is submerged under the job or the task which he has to do. So this is what we call representation. I want a policeman or if the case is my house is on fire, I want a fireman to come. I call the fire brigade. I do not know the individuals who attend not part of the process. I want somebody who can actually handle a hose and put the fire out of my house. And so I want the fire brigade, but there will be sent to me different individuals and different trucks and different equipment to make sure that work gets done. So representation is something that we understand from life itself. Kings send out ambassadors to negotiate on their behalf to represent them. Uh, and it means that the king is not so much in risk for that travel. Um, and that sometimes, of course, an intermediary can do that work better than the king himself might be able to do um, and to negotiate the position to some finality. So there are ambassadors sent out by kings amongst the nations. And so it's no surprise then that God sends angels to his servants to tell them what he wants done, to have discussions with them face to face, to reveal his will to them, to give them commandments and sometimes to give them rebuke because God himself cannot go personally to see those people, but he sends his agents to do his will and to say what he wants to be said. This is a quote from our brother Thomas in Elpis Israel, page 183. It is a well-established principle of the scriptures that what the eternal father does by his agents, his angels, he's considered as doing himself. So we can read that God came down and God said this and God went up or God carved the tables of stone that he gave to Moses, 
that God did all that because his agent, the angel that was sent to do it, was working on behalf of God. This was God's representation. It's what we call the principle of God manifestation, revealing yourself through other people. You know, Jesus was a manifestation of God. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the people which you gave me. So he was somebody who revealed what God was like to us. So when we read of God doing things, it's often in the case that God has done those things through his agent, the angel that was sent on his behalf. And this is a concept which is right there in the pioneer writings of the Christadelphians. And when we come to our next study, God willing, we will look very closely at Michael the Archangel and we'll see how the, the pioneers of the truth understood that concept incredibly well. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we have what is often been described as the most powerful opening to any book that's ever been written, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When you go to the original Hebrew, you are faced with a conundrum because normally when you have a plural word, it has a plural verb to follow it. But in Genesis 1, verse 1, you have this conundrum of a plural word, Elohim, which can mean God, and he created, which is a singular verb. Now, let's read what Brother Thomas had to say about this. He was, of course, a, a very astute Greek scholar, and he worked very closely with Benjamin Wilson, who eventually wrote the Diaglot. John Thomas said this in the Herald 1847, the Elohim gave the word, they brought the latent elements of the world into play. And you notice he's talking here in the plural. So what this is really saying is that when we read in the beginning, Elohim he created. We're talking about many angels doing God's will. So the will, the purpose, the power was with God. The design was with God. But the angels were the instruments of making it happen. So in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, Elohim, he created the heavens and the earth. So going on with Brother Thomas, they gave direction and application to power and the spirit of the everlasting father accomplished all they were employed to effect. The everlasting father, by the Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light. He made the expanse. He called it heaven. He did all this through them. They executed what he empowered them to perform. This is the solution we offer to this grammatical enigma. And I think it's a very, very correct solution. Might I just say that I'm very firmly convinced that when it says in Genesis 1 verse 1 that God created the heavens and the earth, it's not talking about the creation of every single universe that's ever existed, every single star that we can see. The heavens and the earth is a Bible concept for the world we see around us. It's the world we observe with the, the formation of land masses, oceans, animal life, plant life, and man himself living upon the earth. Everything that was created in those first seven days was upon a planet that already existed. The Bible says the earth was, and it was without form and void before God started on the first day to produce light. So, you know, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth is the bringing into pass all the creation we now see around us. So let's just trace this concept of the angels working on behalf of God and representing him to mankind. This is the occasion in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses, who was being a shepherd in the wilderness, having fled from Egypt, sees a bush burning that is not actually being consumed. And when he went close to that bush, it says, the angel of the Lord, or the angel of Yahweh, appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, a bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. So there was in the middle of that bush an angel of God who was there. And so he's called in verse 2 an angel. When you come to verse 4, it says, When Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see that Moses had come, God, or Elohim, which is the word used of angels, called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. So clearly this was an angel, but one who had authority to make promises and predictions for God who was in heaven. So here is what we call the Yahweh angel. This is the mightiest of the angels, now delivering to Moses the plan of God concerning the children of Israel. And when you read the rest of Exodus chapter 3, he not only reveals the name of God to Moses, but he, more than that, he makes all the promises about what God will do because the name Yahweh means he who will be, and, and there are 
a number of references to the fact that he will do this, he will do that. And this is the angel speaking out of the bush on behalf of God. So this angel is called the angel. He's called Yahweh. He's called Elohim. And we have no doubt that this was an angel representing the heavenly father himself, the mightiest of the angels who we believe to be Michael. He was there in that bush and he was talking to Moses. Later, he would meet Moses on Mount Sinai and give him the Ten Commandments and the other things that God delivered through the law of Moses. So we have these appearances of what we call the Yahweh Elohim. And there's one particular angel we'll deal with at length in our next study, who we believe to be Michael, who is called in the Bible the Yahweh Elohim. And you find him very active in the, in the book of Genesis, particularly in chapters 2 and 3, where he not only created the man and the woman, he married them, and then, of course, he was there when they were condemned. So there is an angel who walked in the midst of the garden. There was an angel who conversed with Adam and Eve. There's an angel who formed Eve out of the rib of Adam. But when you go through the Bible, you find so often this angel appears on the earth. In Genesis 17, verse 1 and 18, verse 1, it says, Yahweh appeared unto Abraham. It was not the father that dwells in heaven. It was God's personal representative, the Yahweh Elohim. In Genesis 28, verse 13, about Jacob, reading from the RV, and behold, Yahweh stood by him and said, Yahweh Elohim of Abraham, behold, I am with thee. So, you know, he, again, the promise to Jacob was he would never leave him. He would stay alongside of him all of his life. Exodus 3, verse 18, when Moses went and, and talked about to how he would address the children of Israel, he said, I can say that Yahweh Elohim of the Hebrews hath met with us. And again, he was talking about his personal experience of meeting the angel face to face in the burning bush and on other occasions. These are more in Exodus 17, verse 5 and 6. Yahweh said, I will stand before thee upon the rock. So this wasn't the eternal father in heaven. This was the Yahweh angel who came down and stood on that rock to represent God and, of course, also to prefigure some of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Exodus 33 and verse 11, when Israel was in disgrace because of the golden calf incident, it said that Yahweh spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And we're going to explore in one of our later studies the wonderful friendship between Moses and this angel. And, and they were, went through many, many things together. They were very great friends and very close, and they worked time and time again to save the people of Israel. But the angel was actually there. This was the appearances of the Yahweh Elohim. This was God's representative upon the earth. Just more quotations that say the same thing. Moses drew near where God was when he went up to get the Ten Commandments. Yahweh descended in a cloud and stood with him there. That's Exodus 34 and verse 5. Yahweh came down and stood in Numbers 12 verse 5. Yahweh appeared to Abraham. God went up from Abraham. God called out of the bush. It's so, so conclusive that this angel is actually on earth to represent Yahweh, the Father in heaven. And so it's always spoken of is that Yahweh came, Yahweh went, Yahweh stood, but it was the angel who was performing that for the heavenly Father. In Exodus 24, verse 10, we'll come back to this later on when we talk about the majestic nature of angels, but it says there that Moses and Nadab and Abihu and Aaron and his family they saw the Golahat or the Elohim of Israel, and they saw the many angels that were there, and they also saw the mightiest angel of them all. In Samuel, as we said, Yahweh came and stood to the little boy Samuel. In Exodus 4, when Moses had, had made a mistake, Yahweh met him and sought to kill him. So again, Moses had to quickly correct that situation. When you read about an evil man, a man who, who God tried to save, but in the end who was so determined to do evil, that God had to try and correct him. It says, and God came to Balaam. And again and again, we read that God came to Balaam to try and save him. And then in the end, when he made himself beyond redemption, God then came to him to use him to be a prophet, to deliver prophecies he didn't want to deliver. So, but you just see God interacting with a man. And of course, it was an Elohim, an angel that came to Balaam. And, and again, we have angels appearing on earth. They become God on earth. And this is a concept we must get ahead around, that when people represent God, they can be called God. They can be called by the name of God because they do the will of that heavenly Father. And we can only understand the Bible if we get this concept of God manifestation properly sorted out. And, and there are hundreds and hundreds of occasions where you read about angels being present and active on the earth 
and not the Heavenly Father himself. I want to talk a bit more about the divine family and their relationships. In Psalm 29, verse 1 and 2, we're reading from Rotherham's literal translation, which is perhaps one of the better word-for-word translations of the Old Testament. It says to this, and I'm going to read um, what the margin says, Give to Yahweh, ye sons of the mighty, that is, of course, the angels, give to Yahweh both glory and strength, give to Yahweh the glory of his name, bow down to Yahweh in his glorious sanctuary. And you get this concept of God dwelling in heaven in a sanctuary amongst his his angels around his throne, and it's a glorious sanctuary. And so heaven is a place which is a buzz with excitement and interest and happiness and joy and praise as the angels are a delight in the presence of the heavenly Father and now, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. When you come to Psalm 89, verse 5 to 7, again reading from Rotherham's literal translation, we get another little picture here of what heaven's like and the way it operates. So shall the heavens praise thy wondrousness, O Yahweh, yea, the faithfulness in the convocation of the holy ones. And that word convocation is better translated the sanctuary of the holy ones. So heaven is a sanctuary for God's immortal angels to be with God and to share his joy and his purpose as it unfolds around them. For whom the skies, whom in the skies can one compare unto Yahweh? And can one liken unto Yahweh among the sons of the mighty? So even though the angels are mighty and powerful creatures, though they come to represent God, None of them is anything like the infinity, the majesty, the power, the wisdom of the Heavenly Father himself. They are all, what we might say, just reflections of the Father, but nothing like him in his eternity and his wisdom. But what's more interesting in this particular little passage, it starts to give us some clues about the way the angels operate and how God chooses to use them and how God has given them the privilege of doing his his will in the earth. So it says in verse 7 that the heavenly father is a God-inspiring awe in the circle of the holy ones. So there's something about the way that God operates which is completely interesting. The word circle should be better translated a gathering in secret, as you'll see uh, it's it's used in Ezekiel 13 verse 9. This is a secret gathering. This is something that happens out of the sight of mortal men. Something that happens that people on the earth do not see. And that's the way God operates in directing, in inspiring, and using the initiative of his angels. And we're going to see later on some dramatic examples of the way that God does this. So there is a circle or a, 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 a hidden sanctuary where God and his angels meet together and where they discuss the things that God wants performed in the earth. And it's intriguing when you see how this operates. So... Angels have a lot of knowledge about God. They know far, far more than we do about heaven, but they do not know everything about the plan of God. And and most of the angels are waiting instruction from the leading angels, Gabriel and Michael. In the book of Daniel, chapter 10 and verse 21, when, when Gabriel is talking to Daniel, he says to Daniel, I will show you that which is noted in the scriptures of truth. And there is none that holdeth or understandeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. And they were discussing time periods. Daniel's question always was, how long How long will this be? When will this happen? And Gabriel has to explain that only two of the angels know the full timetable that God has in place, the number of years between the major events in God's purpose. But then Jesus comes along and he says to his disciples, but of the day, which of course is the day of his coming, And that hour when he will call away all of those who are alive and resurrect the dead, of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now, I believe that when Jesus went to heaven, he was given that information, but perhaps the angels still don't know the exact day. They are working to bring the plan of God to pass. They're making sure the nations line up according to the the prophetical timetable. But in the end, only the Son and the Father are now in the knowledge of that day. When Christ was on the earth, he did not know that. But it's something the Father has kept in his own power to be revealed in due time. So again, the the angels have a limited degree of knowledge. They don't know everything, but not all the angels know the time periods, and they they are actually seen on some occasions asking Gabriel and Michael for information. Now, there's a reason why God does that. He wants to make their experience interesting and exciting. They work on events. They work on setting up things that they don't particularly understand. 
But when those things are revealed and they see it come to pass, they rejoice in happiness that they have been successful in performing what God wanted to do. Peter, when he wrote in the first of Peter, chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, talking about the work of the prophets, and he said that the prophets often wrote things down they didn't understand. They kept inquiring about the words they had been caused to write. And he goes on to say this, that the prophets were searching beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, which things the angels decided to look into. So there were some things about the work of Christ which were completely unknown to the angels, and there are future things about the work of Christ that the angels also want to further to understand. And God has held that back from them, that they might have the thrill of exploration and the thrill of understanding when it finally is revealed to them. So a little statement here, angels, though great in knowledge and wisdom, do not have complete foreknowledge. The deity or God delights in stimulating the intellect. And it's the same with us. God doesn't tell us everything we need to know. God hasn't revealed all the time periods to us. God wants us to be constantly excited by finding new things and understanding new things. And when we're made immortal, we're going to have so many things about the process of the kingdom revealed to us that we currently don't know, but would love to know. And that's what God does with his servants. He constantly stimulates their intellect by revealing new things to them as time goes by. So God has a plan and a purpose to reveal things to his angels in due time. Now, there are many things the angels do, and we'll just make a list of these. We'll follow some of these up as we go through. But you think of some of the things the angels did for God. They made a woman from the rib of Adam. The wheels of Pharaoh's chariot suddenly fell off. The order of Dagon of the Philistines was constantly knocked down. There were occasions when Israel was rescued because the invading armies heard the noise of many horses and chariots thundering down upon them. An axe head suddenly floated. An arrow struck the king Ahab in exactly the right spot. A ram was caught in a thicket that Abraham might have it instead of his son. Opening prison doors. How often did God rescue people out of prison when God chose to do so? A coin was found in the mouth of a fish. How did it get there? Two she-bears in the days of Elisha were provoked to anger to avenge Elisha of those who were mocking him. Paul was saved from drowning on four different occasions. Ezra was protected on a very dangerous journey, carrying an enormous sum of money through dangerous country. The inn at Bethlehem had to be full so that Jesus would be born in a stable. A great fish was provided at exactly the right place and moment to swallow Jonah and then to vomit him on land in exactly the right place. Kings and prophets had to be stirred up to work on the work of God and the plagues in Egypt had to be brought that God's people might be rescued. So many things that God has his angels involved in. And we'll come back to many of those as we go through. We're going to see how the angels actually manipulate weather and nature, either using earthquakes or volcanic activity on different occasions, sometimes just bringing bad weather. The flood, of course, was a great uh, downpour that came and flooded the whole earth. Sodom and Gomorrah was a volcanic activity. Famine in the days of Egypt and the days of Joseph Plagues in Egypt, the Red Sea being opened miraculously, the defeat of Sisera by a great thunderstorm, the Battle of Salamis, again, storms that were involved around the, the Persian invasions of Greece, the defeat of Julemain, the fall of Constantinople, the destruction of the Spanish Armada, all of these involved significant weather events. And you can go right on with that list down even to the evacuation of Dunkirk and the invasion of Europe on June the 6th, 1944. So why do angels exist? Well, God is sharing his purpose with them. He's made them his immortal servants. They represent God to mortal men. They act for God and watch for God. They watch over God's people and they direct the affairs of the nations. They stand by us, working to get us into the kingdom. We may share eternity with them. In our next study, we're going to look at Michael the archangel. And here, of course, is the Yahweh angel. And I think you'll be very surprised by how many times we can actually trace this individual through the Bible and what a wonderful person he was to represent the Heavenly Father upon the earth. But in conclusion, let me just quote to you some of the words of Gabriel and some of the words of Michael. Now, what I want you to take away from these quotations, which I won't particularly go into the context of, but all of these are statements made by the angels where they were exalting in the fact that they had achieved what God sent them to do. So 
In Daniel 11, verse 1, the angel talking to, to Daniel says, you see Darius on the throne. You see that king that came to the throne. You see the overthrow of the Babylonian empire. Well, even I, and it's, it's a sense of, of triumph in those words, I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. That king is there because I made him come at the right time. In Zechariah 1, verse 11, we have a vision of, of, of a superintending angel directing other angels. And he's called the angel of Yahweh that stood amongst the myrtle trees. There again is that word stood in the record. They come back to this angel and report, we have walked to and fro through the earth and behold, the earth is still as still and is at rest. So a time of peace had come on the earth by the work of the angels. Again, the sense that they had done what they were required to do. In Ezekiel 9 verse 11, the angels were sent forth to try and find anyone in Jerusalem worthy of saving and to mark that man accordingly. And they come back to the leading angel and say, I have done as you have commanded me. Um, so interesting, isn't it, that there was angels who actually are very, very proud of the fact that they achieve what God sends them to do. So then we await the day when we will be equal unto the angels, when we will not die anymore, then we'll actually share the work of the angels in performing the will of God upon the earth because we will be resurrected, made immortal, and be like them. And the promise in Zechariah 3 is the same as the one in Luke chapter 20, that if we are righteous, if we do what God requires, if we keep God's charge, then he will give us places to walk or a right of access to be amongst those that stand by today, which, of course, are the angels. And there are the promises of equality with the angels in both Old and New Testament that we can share that hope of being like them in the future. Thank you for listening in, and we hope to come back next week and to talk about Michael and maybe also move on to Gabriel. So thank you for your interest, and we trust this has been of help to you in understanding the angels of God.